quality control on it. Um, and, you know, we use it for other things also. But uh, with the gamma camera, you have to have the thyroid uptake probes. How many of you do not have thyroid uptake probes? Okay. Um, some facilities, what they'll do is they put a pinhole cam, pinhole collimator on, and they use that to count the capsule and count the thyroid. Um, it's not the best method. Can anybody tell me why? Uh, the pinhole camera is collimating out some of the radiation that could be accepted. Well, have you, have you used a pinhole collimator before? Yes. Have you used it? Okay, what happens if you raise or lower the distance from the patient? It's going to read differently. Okay. Or, or um, can you cut it off sometimes if it's too low? Yeah, if you're too close, then you want, you know, it, it literally magnifies the image. If you're too far away, it minifies it. But if you're using it to count, uh, to do a thyroid uptake and scan, the problem that you run into is if you don't use the same distances, you're going to get different readings. You know, some people wind up getting things like 110% for their uptakes. Okay, how you can do that, I don't know. But the thing is, it's mostly because of problems with using a pinhole collimator and a different distance. Most people now rely on their uptake probes. The uptake probe is different because it has what they call a flat field collimator. Uh, let me tell you what we mean by a flat field collimator. Well, first of all, let's look at the pinhole first. Okay, with the pinhole, changes in distance. So let's say here's my patient. Here's their thyroid gland. And here's their head. Okay, changes in distance here are going to affect your count rate and also the size. Okay, so um, that's a problem. The uptake probe has what they call a flat field which means that if you were to have anything within this area, it doesn't matter whether it's up here, or down here, or down here, you're still going to get the same radiation reading. Okay? In other words, you know, like if you remember with the, with the pinhole collimator, the photons traveling from this side of the body are recorded over here. The photons over here are recorded on the opposite side. There's literally a reverse or mirror image when you use a pinhole collimator. Uh, it gives us the best detail. You know, so whenever you're doing a study that you need to get a good detail for, say, a bone scan or a thyroid or a renal study, um, most of the time you'd be using this for a DMSA renal study. A DMSA renal study is where they're evaluating how much functioning kidney there is left. So we inject dimercurial succinic acid. We wait about 30 minutes, then we start taking pictures. What happens is the DMSA gets trapped in the glomerulus, and then by taking a picture with a high resolution uh, pinhole collimator, um, you know, you can see the areas much more clearly. Same thing if you guys get a bone scan. Let's say you want to take a comb down picture of the know, an area. Rather than using computer magnification, you can use a pinhole collimator. Okay, but this is what they call a flat field, and it means that anything that's in there, uh, it won't distort the numbers, or at least not as much as it would over here. Okay, and that's usually, sometimes you'll see that as a board question. Okay, but going back to the calibration of instruments here. Now this type, this is mainly dealing with quality control, but I want to make sure that before anybody starts talking about the quality control, that we review the units. I want to make sure that everyone's clear on radiation units. Um, Now, your Geiger counter, all of your gas detectors measure Rentgens. And Rentgens, okay, 
basically we're talking about ionization of gas or air. And that's important. Okay? And you'll see why in just a minute. We're, we're trying to phase out the Renton. Okay? But some of the interesting things about it, okay, so the only material that we use to detect and measure the Renton is air or gas. It only measures X-ray or gamma rays below 3 MeV. You cannot use the Renton to detect particle radiations. So alpha and beta particles are not counted with this. Okay. Um, the new or the international unit for the Renton is equal to 2.58 times 10 to the fourth, 10 to the minus fourth coulombs per kilogram of air. So basically, what we're doing is we're measuring uh, an electric charge in a volume or mass of gas. Okay. That, yeah, that this one you guys should have. Okay. But this oh, will you keep our notes? Our notes with us from quarter one? Yeah. Because we just pulled like four different things from quarter one. Yeah. So it's a good idea to bring everything to class? Well, don't, don't worry about it right now, okay? Um, like I said, what I want to do right now is, is go over the units that we, um, so you'll understand what we're talking about when we read what a millirentgen is versus a millirad versus a millirem. You know, your film badge reports come back to you in millirem. Um, what we're now doing is we're substituting rentgens and rads for each other. Because one rentgen is almost equal to one rad. But one of the reasons why we're getting rid of the Renkin is are these things here. Okay, you know, basically it's an electric charge measured in a um, weight or mass of gas. So coulombs per kilogram is what they use for the SI unit. Um, typically, this one down here, the 2.08 times 10 to the 9th ion pairs, this is what we call an electrostatic unit. So for the CGS system, I mean, do you remember we have different measuring systems? Um, we have the English system. We have the CGS, MKS, and then we have SI. English is what we have here, quarts, gallons, feet, pounds, things like that. Uh, CGS is centimeters grams and seconds. Um, and this one here, the unit of force is the erg, because we're going to be talking about an erg is equal, or 100 ergs per gram equal a rad. Um, the MKS, this is meters, kilograms, and seconds. And here the unit of force is the newton. And the SI system is kind of a hybrid of the MKS. It's usually the metric system. But basically, this was developed around 1954. Um, it never really took off here in the United States. But um, one of the reasons why they came up with it is because other branches of science were having too many conversions. And they were changing radioactivity to their particular whatever they needed it for. You know, so physics, chemistry, anatomy, biology, um, they said we need a, a different unit because every time you have a conversion of some kind, that changes the accuracy. You know, it starts adding fewer decimal points of precision. So um, what we've done then is we're what we're mainly going to concentrate on are what we call the traditional radiation units and the international radiation units. You've already had some exposure to that with the Baccarel. Um, the Baccarel just started taking off a few years ago. Mostly we've been using millicuries and curies. But, um, you know, as I said, they're, they're trying to get all of us to use this uh, international system, and I don't think anybody is really going with it. I, I know I don't like it. I know when I go to the grocery store, 
and I see that I have a one liter bottle of Coca-Cola versus a one quart bottle of Coca-Cola, um, it's too confusing for me. So anyway, but the Renton, like I said, it's, it's going to be obsolete. Uh, but, and the reason why we can't use the uh, radiator of this unit above 3 MeV, um, if you remember, we had one type of interaction where the photon energy was completely absorbed by an electron. What interaction was that? Well, here's a, here's a 3 MeV photon. And it's going to be absorbed by an atom through that method. What method is that where the photon energy is completely absorbed? Coherent. Well, here are your choices. Coherent, uh, photoelectric, Compton, uh, pair production, And photonuclear disintegration. Okay, so uh, Mr. Singh, which one of it do you think it is? Number two. Okay, same same with you, Ashley. Sure. Okay, um, Mr. Greg, what do you think it is? One of the last two. I think one photo disintegration. Okay, Monica, you said number the last one. Okay. Okay, we got one for up here. Photoelectric. 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 Okay. okay, the answer is photoelectric. Is that totally absorbed? Totally absorbed. Okay, so what happens then is, okay, remember, it's absorbed here, and we have this electron kicked out. Oh, yeah. Coherence totally absorbed too, and then it creates a secondary with the same. Well, coherent same. means that it comes in and it leaves at the same energy. Mm -hmm. Right. It so causes it's vibration. On what, what happens after? Well, well technically, coherence totally absorbs and then it lets go in a second part, and photo disintegration does too, but it's got to be 10 MeV, so I know that wasn't that. Well, you know, photonuclear gets absorbed by the nucleus. The nucleus, right. And then it kicks out a proton or neutron. Okay, but with coherent, it would come in at 3 MeV. There would no be no electron. Yeah, but you didn't say that, though. All you said was absorbed. Did I say that? Yeah, all you said was absorbed. That's all you said. <laughs> That's why I wasn't sure which one it was. Okay. That's all extra credit. No, I'm just saying that. I'm just trying to be specific on the whole thing. Don't you love this? Boy, controversial nuclear medicine. Okay. Here's the problem, though. We know that the more energy that these electrons absorb, the further they're going to travel, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So if we wanted a radiation detector to detect this thing, now this is going to be 3 MeV minus the binding energy. Okay. And normally the binding energy for electrons in gases is around, it's not very high, maybe 34, 35,000 electron volts. So the problem that we have here is that this thing is going to get kicked out. It's going to travel a far distance. In fact, and it's going to have so much energy, it would actually leave the detector. So if you had a Geiger counter, and if this interaction took place, some of the electrons would actually go undetected because they would be kicked out. And as a result of that, that would make the instrument inaccurate. So that's why they limit it. If you wanted a detector that would make sure that this didn't happen, it would have to be as big as a house. That would be a little impractical to carry around um, in the nuclear medicine department. Okay, So that's why we're not using it for higher than 3 MeV. Um, I gave a fluoroscopy class to radiation therapists. They had never heard of a Rentgen before. And I thought, how could that be? Well, then I realized, those guys don't work with radiation that's at 3 MeV. They work with stuff that's like 6 to 10 MeV. So, of course, they would never deal with that. Yeah.